I th- I'm sorry. I thought we were starting at 10:45. My apologies, my frisky little ponies who are all in their stalls and ready to go. And Jerry and I were up here thinking we had all kinds of time. Welcome to the Learning Should Be Fun seminar. Now, when Jerry and I communicated about this seminar, um, he told me that he had been asked to be the moderator, and I was the panelist. I said, okay, and he said, but we'll share. We'll do it together. That's why I love working with Jerry. And uh, I said, great. So I get here, and, you know, you dump your packet out to find what's in it, and three ribbons fell out, and mine says moderator. So I... (laughs) So I went to Jerry, and I said, what's that say? He said, moderator. I said, what's that make you? He said, panelist. (laughs) And I said, but we'll share. So... Anyways, what our focus is here to do today is, of course, we want to try to retain those people that we work hard to have come into our classes, and we want to provide an environment during this learning process that gives them some enjoyment. Now, personal background on myself, I used to be an elementary school teacher. I was the strictest teacher in the school. All the children were deathly afraid of me which I loved and cultivated with all my heart, until I got them into my class, and then I didn't have to be the disciplinarian because they already knew that what I said went. Well, you know, the difference between children and adults is those children had to come back every day. And adults don't have to. It's very different to work with adults than it is to work with children. And my kids were little. And... uh, uh, after a while, I mean, we, we had a great time. I enjoyed teaching very much, and now I'm, but I'm now teaching again, but I'm teaching in a different arena, teaching adults, teaching for recreation. We're not teaching a, an exhibition team who, who's going to go out and perform. This is a recreation. It's also a different focus. So Jerry and I have put a lot of thought and discussion into how we want to approach this, and since I am the moderator, Deborah Carroll Jones from Arlington, Texas, and Jerry is the panelist, he gets to go first. Mr. Jerry Junk. <laughs> all right. Welcome. We're glad to have all of you here, and thank you very much. You will see me frequently pull my glasses off and take them on, because somewhere in Wichita are my real glasses, <laughs> if they ever show up. Anyway, teaching to me is the single most important thing that a square dance caller can do. I think it is our biggest responsibility. It is our biggest contribution to the activity because it, in fact, creates the activity that we have. And in all the schools that I do, when I ask people what do they feel is their most or their their, their biggest asset as a caller, they will tell you that uh, teaching is the thing they do best. I will tell you as a group, I think that's exactly wrong. I think very few of us are very good teachers. Teaching almost to me is an art. And at best, I think you can just judge from the dancers that we see. We don't teach as well as we should. I also think that in today's activity especially, one of the things we need to think about with our teaching is that because there are time constraints on people's time, first of all, to take lessons, And could I ask you to shut that door, please? Yeah, turn the latch. I had to to do it yesterday, too. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, when, when, When people come to class, obviously they don't have as much time to devote to the activities we'd like to see them. The clubs don't have the finances to afford a lengthy series of lessons. So two things I think we need to do be when we are teachers is to be first effective and second efficient. And you achieve achieve efficiency when we reduce frustration. So that's what I look at when I'm trying to teach a class. How do I reduce the frustration of dancers? And you do it in a lot of different ways, the ways you present calls, uh, the, the ways that you demonstrate calls or do you explain calls. How can you articulate 
basically square dancing is a foreign language. How can you articulate a foreign language in people terms? How can you explain this call in people terms? The definitions are for callers, not necessarily for the dancers. They need to know how to physically execute a call and to understand what it does. So you need to be efficient and effective, not only with your teaching, but with the way you explain things. And the easiest way you can explain something, the less frustration. And that makes happy dancers. Also, when you uh, teach, and there's a whole bunch of responsibilities that go along with it, First of all, you have to set the hook for the enjoyment of the activity, create, a, create happy and competent dancers. And if dancers are competent, they'll be happy. Nothing is more frustrating, and you see it on people's faces when they go to a dance and they can't execute what was called. And so if they're competent, they're happy. They also have confidence, and that's what your job is. And then a, a bigger thing, and we've gotten away from this because we've gotten so intrigued with choreography, we need to be able to entertain the dancers, whether they're the first night beginners or whether they've danced for a long time. We, we need to keep that in mind. We've, we've become very intrigued with choreography, uh, maybe to the point that we have forgotten some of the entertainment value. So uh, this session is about how do we entertain people. I think that what does it exactly say, Deborah? Learning should, Learning should be fun. And it indeed should be. This is a recreation. It's uh, not somebody's job. So you try to make it fun. There are some requirements for that. Uh, first of all, you need to be prepared. Have a plan. Have a program. Know what you're going to teach. When you're going to teach a certain call so that you can use that call to set up calls down the line. Know your definitions and know how you're going to present that definition to those dancers. Be able to explain the new calls in a language that the dancers can understand. Be aware of the fact that there are degrees of difficulty in teaching new calls. What are the easiest ways to present a call for the first time? What's the easiest way to set a call up? What's the most difficult? Um, what formations or setups make that call more difficult? How do you proceed from the least complex to the more complex? And then I have one here that may upset some people, but I think as callers we need to have empathy for the new dancers. And I don't see that in a lot of cases. I see callers, I have seen callers actually yell at dancers. I know of one, one guy recently that uh, I was told about actually got down and physically moved some dancers in a square. That's inexcusable. And those people will not stay. That's not fun. That's not fun. And I'm going to relate a little story. Deborah has heard this story uh, that made me realize that when people come to a square dance class, most people have really no anti-square dance feelings out there. People just don't know about us. However, when they're asked to come to a square dance class, they are extremely nervous. And I don't mean a little nervous. I mean extremely nervous, and they're scared to death. And the reason is they don't want to be embarrassed. They see people doing stars, square through, swing throughs. And I can't do that. They don't realize that it's a step-by-step -step process. And quite a few years ago, when I was still calling for clubs in Nebraska, I called for a little club at Orchard, Nebraska, had our first night of lessons. And the stage happened to be right by the door where people came in, little steps up. And this couple came in who have since become uh, club officers. They became club president. They were even presidents of the Northeast Nebraska Federation. So they became very good dancers. They were younger in their early 50s at that time. And when they came in, I had everybody in the circle just ready to start the, the first, first thing we were going to do. And I just stepped off the stage because they were there, said, hi, how you doing? Welcome. Hop right in here. Later on, Sharon Jones told me, she said, had you not done that, we were out of there. And I said, really? And she said, yes. She said, when we came up those stairs and all those people stared at us, she said, that's as scared as I have ever been. Now think about that. 
these people are 50 years old. And she said, had you not stepped off the stage, we were gone. And they later became officers of the Federation. I don't think we give near enough credence to that. I don't think we do. And I have made it my goal, and I, I teach, I call full time, but I, the only year I've not taught at least one class is the year I was drafted in the Army. So I'm very proud of that. When I teach classes, I greet everybody at the door, make no mistake about it. I'm set up, I greet them at the door, and I check palms. You will know who the most worried person is because their palms are sweating, and you can laugh about it, but it's a fact. And that's the person that's going to have the most trouble in your class that day. And I can tell you that unequivocally, not because they're stupid, because they're terrified. They've not been in a class setting for a long, long time. And it's something that's really, really needs to be thought about. And when I teach the first two calls, I teach them an Alaman left and a dose of dough to start with. That's the lady that I take. I walk on the floor and I take her and she'll drag her up with two feet to go out in the middle of the floor. But I take her because she's the one that needs the individual attention. Uh, she's the one that has to, that I have to get off the stage, get down on floor level with her so that we're eye to eye and I touch her and she knows that I'm no different than she is. I'm not the instructor looking down. Now, she also needs the individual attention, but I can't say because you're stupid, you go out there and do that. <laughs> you, you just don't talk to people like that and she's not stupid, she's nervous. Keep that in mind. And each tip that I teach something then, I take a different lady or a different couple. And eventually, as the day, morning wears on or the evening, whatever you're doing, it becomes kind of a game like, oh, is he going to get us this time? You know. Yeah, I said, okay. And, I, and I, I do this deliberately, and I'll go out and, you know, this lady promised to help me. And she's going, oh, God, you know. But the point is, I start to play with them right off the bat. And I'm, I'm a real believer in that. They need to know that you're a team, not an instructor and dancers. And I really try to do that, to create a team effect. I, I think it's so important that you make them feel like they're welcome. And I try to learn their names. If uh, I'm pretty disappointed if I don't have their names by the second week. Um, and why would you do that? What's the one thing in this life that's yours is their name. It's their name. And it's really important. So I make a game out of that. And I try to reduce frustration. I try to make it learning fun by doing things like that. And if we goof up, if we do some, do some things, I can do a little comedy. Uh, they don't do the ladies change right or, or, or everybody breaks down and says, well, now you know we're going to do that again. And it becomes kind of a buzzword. They'll break down and you'll hear the square go, we know we're going to do that again. But it's a game. And all of a sudden they're having fun. So that's something, empathy is something I think we really need to keep, keep in mind. Also, when you're teaching, know whom you're teaching. Are you teaching kids? Young couples, retired people, big difference. Kids, if they make a mistake, oh well. Young people, if they make a mistake, oh well. Older people, if they make a mistake, I'm embarrassed. I should have known better. And they're very embarrassed by it. Are they harder to teach? I'm not so sure they are. Uh, some are. But by and large, I think people, uh, if, if you work at it, are, are pretty easy to teach. Consider your music. Uh, and by that, consider your, your audience. Are they young, young couples? Are they retired? Uh, what kind of music are you going to use? Does it have a good beat? Does it fit the age group? Does it make people want to dance? Uh, learn the names of the dancers. Um, gives them the feeling of belonging. The fear factor, as I talked about. And I know I'll get some, some um, disagreement with this. But when I teach beginners, I'm not teaching them to dance advanced. I'm teaching them to dance standard choreography if I have a short time frame. 
Uh, Mesa's different, that's a different world. But in a club setting when I taught 20 lessons, I tried to teach the standard positions first that I could get them dancing, get them hooked. And then in the summertime or whenever, my preference is to use that time rather than teach a plus class, or they call it a plus workshop now, but a plus class, I would much rather use that time to teach four boys square through, four girls square through. Once I have them hooked, then I want to add to it, or can we do same-sex flutter wheels, same-sex reverse flutter wheels, that type of thing. But I think you need to get them hooked first, and you need to keep the frustration to a minimum, and then you have happy dancers. Um, and some nights you just simply have to say, guys, we're just going to dance tonight. We're just going to party. Dennis down here is doing the best job of teaching dancers of anybody I know. Dennis O'Neill, hold your hand up. He's just having phenomenal success. He is a second-year caller. And I'm, I'm proud of you. I really am. He, yeah, he's just doing a great job. But I can tell you without even seeing him teach, they're having fun, aren't they? Yeah. I know that just because I can tell from your personality how it is. And that's why they come back. you got to have fun. Those are some prerequisites, some things that I think we need to uh, keep in mind. Um, I teach in a Sicilian circle, with, which is a two-couple circle all the way around. And I do that because it doesn't exclude people. Uh, if you haven't used it, give it some thought. But when... Uh, you can teach so many calls with that Sicilian circle. And then if you have couples who are having difficulties, she's not getting along with him or they're arguing or one's having trouble and together they're not doing that well. In the Sicilian circle, you have two couples facing, uh, two ladies chain, everybody pass through, move on to the next, and they're gone. But you didn't say to this angel, you take Betty and you take Bob and put them in different squares. That's embarrassing to people. Reduce the frustration. You can do it without them ever knowing you did it. And keep the frustration to a minimum so that learning indeed is fun. Uh, I'll turn this over to Deborah. I know she has some comments. Thank you, Jerry. Um, have you heard the expression, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? Okay. Well, as the instructor, if I'm not having a good time, ain't nobody having a good time. So I have looked at, to, tried to take this picture apart and begin to look at how, can, how do I make it fun for me, which then will translate to fun for the students. Well, the first thing I had to learn was what's fun for some people is not fun for somebody else. And I wrote down a couple of things here. Um, do you remember, or maybe some of you are this person, when you were in school and you got your math homework and the instructor would tell you, your teacher would say, do the odd numbered problems for homework tonight? And some math geek would do them all because it was fun? That's not fun for me, okay? I keep my checkbook in pencil, all right? <laughs> That's truth. That's truth. <laughs> so math, that kind of stuff is not fun for me. Um, we have Frank Lane down here in the front row. Now, Frank and my husband, John Jones, will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and nose-to-nose -nose and argue and fuss and fight, and their voices will go up, and they will just go at it, and they both believe in what they're saying, and they are having the time of their lives. Okay. Conflict used to scare me to death. Didn't like conflict. If a fuss started at a family gathering or something, I was gone. Now, I've learned through the years, and especially in the last six years of being married to John, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, I stand up there, and, yeah. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that your friendship is over or that your relationship has soured because you're, you're quote-unquote arguing a point. But to some people, that's really fun. For other people, it scares them to death. Another thing I wrote down, we've got another gentleman here in the front row who I happen to know is a football coach. Now, if I know that about somebody, I know how that man's mind works. 
Okay? He's thinking plays. He's thinking strategy. He's going to put those players in the best lineup so he can win his game. That's a guy to whom the choreographic puzzle of this activity is going to appeal big time. Now, if I know that about some of the people in the class, I can, just because of years of living, figure out what's going to be a little bit fun for them. And hopefully I can throw some of that out there during my teaching to keep them interested. Now, what about some of the quieter souls, the softer ones who are not the first one to square up? Yeah, I know, I look at you. <laughs> Those are the ones that I have to approach. I have to step over that barrier and walk up to them and put my hand out and say, now, li yes, and say, now, listen. <laughs> For those of you on the tape that are listening to the tape portion of that, Jerry just slid over and put his head on my shoulder, and my husband shot up in the back row and told him to watch it. So just, just in case you're driving along somewhere and listening to the tape. Um, I like to try to read the people in my class. I had to do that as, an, as a teacher, as an elementary school teacher, and see the little kids who were a little bit shy and the kids who were right out there and the kids who were probably going to be under my skin for the entire school year and uh, kind of figure those kids out and see how I could work with them. Well, the same thing happens with adults, but I want to caution you about something, folks. When you deal with adults, every one of us walks into any new situation like a score dance class, and we already have an identity in place. We have a persona that we believe in, that we have worked for, that we have fought for, and we want to protect that. We will guard that persona at all costs. And if you do embarrass someone, they, they will not come back. Now, I was raised with boys. Boys like to tease, especially girls. So I grew up in a household where you had to kind of fight for your own territory, and you had to be able to take the ribbing and the teasing and the practical jokes and all that kind of stuff and, and give it back. That was part of the fun, was learning how you could get them back. So I like to tease, but I have to be very careful. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Dennis can attest to this. One of the first times I ever met him at a festival, uh, I stole his briefcase. He set it down and was talking to somebody, and I just went by and picked it up. And he went to go for his briefcase, and it was gone. And somebody ratted me out and said, she took it. And anyway, we started. I, he loved it. He liked to tease. So we have had a long, ongoing thing where we tease each other. But I would absolutely die if I thought I had hurt someone's feelings. So how do I find those people in a beginner's class that I think I can tease, that I can get away with? Now... I look for the person who walks in the door who has the, a smile, the biggest smile when they walk in. Their eyes are kind of, they're, they're kind of white around the edges, their eyes are wide open, and they're sort of looking around at what kind of a situation is this going to be. And of course, as instructor, I have gone up and shook their hands and introduced myself to them. I want to know what their name is. And maybe during the first little thing that we're teaching, um, the girl, we teach the girls to perhaps roll away. I'm choosing something. And Bill, this was the guy in the last class, he didn't get a girl. I don't know what happened to her or where she went, but I looked, and Bill had no woman. And I said, Bill, you lost your woman. And, and he kind of looked around like, oh, my gosh, that was my name. And, uh, and he grinned at me, you know, and so a little bit later in the class, uh, something went on, and I said, Bill, where's your woman? And he... He didn't know where she'd gone. Well, as soon as that little thing was over, I ran up to him and I said, I know I teased you a little bit. I hope that's okay. He said, oh, of course it is. You go right ahead and tease me. All right, well, maybe the next night, Bill's doing pretty good. Bill has a woman every time I look. I don't say anything to him. By golly, if at the end of that night, Bill doesn't come and say, you didn't say anything to me all night. You didn't pick on me, you didn't tease me. But I have had to very cautiously establish that relationship. And I'm very careful with that. But it does, it does delight me. I mean, I get a, a kick out of them teasing or, or them turning around and popping back at me. I like that too, you know, like, well, if you'd send me one, I'd get one. And that, that tickles me and everybody laughs and I don't ever mind being the, the brunt of a, of a teasing experience. 
I did find out, I thought in my naivety that everybody was born with a sense of humor, kind of like a nose or ears. We all just sort of came out with that in place. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and uh, some people do have a very good sense of humor, but they hide it. And they don't share it with uh, just anybody. You have to get to know them. And then all of a sudden, this little rascal part of their personality will pop out. Um, I watch for that during a class as well. If I see them chatting with somebody, I think, oh, okay, they will talk. They're just maybe a little afraid of me, or, or maybe John is a little, you know, they don't want to come up and confess to him that they didn't understand, so they'll go and talk to somebody else. And then I kind of go a circuitous route to find out about that person and their personality and find out how I can connect with them. Ladies, when you shop for perfume, have you ever found that the perfume that smells wonderful on your girlfriend does not smell good on you? Gentlemen, have you smelled a, a perfume on one woman where, where, or cologne even on a man where you think, oh my goodness, did they bathe in that before they came out? Good Lord, have mercy. It makes your eyes water. And, and I kind of perceive humor like that. What smells good on one person doesn't necessarily smell good on somebody else. What I can get away with, Jerry can probably get away with, but maybe John can't, or maybe Frank can't. We have to know who we are before we can start to let that part of our personality show to the people we have in the class. You said something that really triggered something for me, Jerry. I wrote it down here. You said that when they become afraid in the class and they become embarrassed, um, they won't come back. And what I wrote down here is terror cancels comprehension. The system shuts down. And it doesn't matter how much you say, they don't hear it. It's just words. It reminds me of a cartoon, and, and it was two panels, and it was this guy was standing here, and he was talking to his, to his dog, okay? Now, I want you, Jerry, to pretend that, that, that I've been a bad dog, okay? And, and my name is Ginger, all right? So I want you to, you know, when we talk to an animal, we have to use their name. Just like, like people, they like to hear their name, too. That's what they, so talk to me like I'm a bad dog. Ginger, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog. You know what Ginger heard? Ginger, blah, 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 blah. Because Ginger didn't understand what he was saying. All he knew was tone. But it's just noise at that point in time. And I did not understand that as an instructor. I lacked that understanding, that empathy, until my father took square dance lessons. My sweet daddy, who is gone now, bless his ever-loving heart, was not the brightest bulb in the string in a square dance class. Daddy had problems learning. And so every week, I would call him and say, how did your lesson go? What happened? Tell me about it. Well, one day I called him. We lived about 60 miles apart. And uh, he said it was horrible. I said, what happened? He said, I couldn't understand anything the guy said. I couldn't remember anything. My partner was never where she was supposed to be. I was always in the wrong place. And he just went on. Blah, 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 blah. And on the other end of the line, I was giggling. And he didn't appreciate that particularly at the time. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I said, Daddy, that's normal. Every student goes through that. And he asked an awesome question. He said, why didn't they tell us that then? Why don't we tell them they're going to have an off night? Why don't we tell them we're going to have an off night? Why don't we tell them, God help us if we both have it at the same time? Okay? And, and that has been something that I have definitely tried to incorporate to make it more comfortable. Jerry has a comment. I have a dad also. <laughs> my dad, I took square dance lessons when I was 16 with my parents. And I'd never heard my mom say anything that wasn't just, you know, just the right thing to say. But dad had trouble with wheel and deal. And I mean, big time. He was going to quit. And we were sitting at breakfast one morning and dad said, I'm not going back. I can't learn wheel and deal. And my mom, she says, if you're sleeping with me, you're learning wheel and deal. <laughs> <laughs> And I like to fell off my chair. And my, my brother and my sister and I, we never said a word. I mean, not a word. 
anyway, about three weeks later, Dad said one night, he said, well, that ain't hard. Mom said, I've been telling you that for three weeks, and they danced till about two years ago. But I learned so much from my father going through that process. And another, what, he, what he explained to me, and you may not have thought about it like this, is I said, I don't understand. Maybe you can help me with this since you're going through the learning process. Why, when dancers get lost, they just mill around like you've stomped on an anthill and the ants just scramble and they don't know what they're doing. Why can't they, they go home and straighten themselves? Why, I don't understand that. And Daddy said, okay, I'll tell you what the experience is like. It's like you've just been jerked underwater. He said, you can hear noise. And if you've been underwater, you can hear, you know, voices, okay? If you open your eyes underwater and you happen to be in a pool, you can see colors and shapes, right? But you can't distinguish anything. You don't know where you are in space at that point in time. You have shapes, you have colors, and you have noise, but none of it means anything. So that the more that the instructor is going, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 all they're hearing is the blah, blah, blah. It's almost like you have to stop at that point in time and give them an opportunity to take a little rest, a little break. Take a deep breath. Breathe with me. Let's work through this and start again because it, it, it can be a very disconcerting experience. And when my father explained it to me like that and I could visualize the experience of the learners, I was more empathetic and I could understand it a little bit easier. Um, Jerry mentioned about not going down and moving people where they're supposed to be. Uh, I use a, I have found sometimes threats and intimidation can work really well when you're, when you're dealing with, with getting people where you want them to be. And I will say, don't make me come down there. And they stop and they listen and they're all looking around and seeing who's supposed to go with who. I have gone down and touched in the square. We have one lady in our class right now. This is, I think, her fourth or fifth class. How many times has she been through with you, Vernon? Uh, for the tape, Vernon went, I don't know. Twice. And these are the three Saturday lessons, right? So she's been with him a total of six full day Saturdays. And she came to uh, the class that John and I were teaching. And, and one of the biggest problems we've had with her is getting her hands in ready dance position. She puts it, she drops them down by her side. The hand will kind of, uh, I can't even think of her name right now. I've said it so many times. Juanita, Juanita, please put your hands in ready dancing position right here. Okay. And the next call would come, and that part of her brain that had just translated that to the muscles goes blank as a computer screen that's just gone to the blue screen of death, and the hands fall. And um, so... We've reminded her and reminded her, and so one day she was out there, she happened to be on the end of the line, and I have a very long cord on my microphone, so if I threaten to come down there, I can physically actually do it. So anyways, I said, Juanita, and she stopped and looked up, and I walked out, and here was a hand, and it was in ready dance position, and I took a hold of it, and I said, look what I see, and she looked at her hand, and I said, it's a hand, <laughs> And I said, and she looked, and I said, and it's in ready dance position. I want to kiss it. And, she, and everybody laughed, you know, and she just kind of perked right up because she wasn't getting scolded. She was getting a positive reinforcement. I do like to use people's names. They like to hear them. But if you follow it up with a compliment, um, I think that, that they appreciate that, that nobody wants to be singled out and, and scolded unless they're a bill and don't care. Um, so if you praise someone, praise them by name. It's nice to praise the group. Um, and I have a couple of, um, of calls that I'd like to share with you how I teach them, if that's all right with you guys, to, to show you how I have tried to incorporate some humor and some silly stuff into what we're doing to make it a little bit easier to understand. The first one that I want to share with you is walk around the left-hand lady, or we've changed the, the title of it to all around the left-hand lady, walk around the corner, what it, okay, whatever the vernacular is now, that call. And um, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, you all may be outstanding teachers, but do you have any problems with sometimes them doing some bizarre back-to-back, -back, flipping around, spinning, do -si do thing, and they don't stay connected at the, at the shoulder, the right shoulder? All right, well, if I could, I can come down there, and um, Jerry, you want to come on down front, and we'll demonstrate this, okay? Good job, good job. All right, 
so that we can be heard on the tape. I will tell them with their corner that they are going to stand right shoulder to right shoulder. And now when you get this close to somebody, our natural inclination is to disconnect eye contact. Have you noticed that? Because we're a little close. We're kind of in each other's space. So we're sort of looking off and and uh, I want them to look at each other. I said, I want you to look right at that person. Don't look. Make googly eyes at them. <laughs> now, <laughs> he's laughing. He's not making googly eyes. He's laughing. All right, now we're going to walk forward. We're not going to stop making googly eyes at each other. Let's go. All right. Well, now you'll still have some that will spin around, okay? And I thought, oh, how, can, how much clearer can I be? So I stopped and I said, all right. We're going to have to have a workshop on googly eyes. And so when we did, we just made a workshop out of googly eyes and silly faces that we made at each other. And people were laughing and, and enjoying themselves. And I thought, well, okay, that's a pretty good explanation. All right, John gets up to do the next tip. Here's how he explained it. All right, turn face your corner. Right shoulder to right shoulder, Velcro. <laughs> now, move. And there we went, right? <laughs> Was that brilliant or what, right? I'm going through this big googly eyes thing, you know, Velcro. And it just hit the nail right on the head. Everybody did exactly what they wanted. They all laughed just like you did. And everybody was successful. And with the, with the success ratio going up, you have happy, positive dancers. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd use a lot of the same things. Now, Velcro, I'm going to borrow that, John. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I play with them. I kind of pick on the boys. I, when I explain calls and I say, now, girls, if, if say for a walk and dodge, we have, we have the girls looking out. I say, girls, if you turn around on a walk and dodge, the boys will be wrong. And I, everything I do, I always say, you know, girls, if, if this doesn't go right, the boys will be wrong. Well, it it kind of makes a contest out of these boys to straighten up just a little bit and pay attention. <laughs> And the boys, they, they kind of get in the game. Well, we're not going to fall down on this one. And so we're talking again about learning can be fun, and that's the atmosphere that you want to create. You want to create it with your club even after they're done with class. You want, you want to have fun. You want to have them enjoying each other. Something that uh, we haven't talked about, we were talking about empathy a little bit ago. Something that you need to do is get around during the class and listen to them. In Mesa, we have them dancing with other callers and stuff. Listen, because they'll tell you, well, the other night we were with, with so-and-so. We had trouble with this. Would you review this? Well, that tells me they need another teach on it. And you can help even the other callers in the area when they go back. Then they'll have that that night, and they'll be able to do it you know, elsewhere. So I find listening to them, or, or I have, I'm having trouble at your dance the other night when I danced with you, we just had a terrible time with Dixie style. Can we review that? Listen to what they're telling you, and don't be afraid to implement that into your, your uh, lesson plan or your class, or they've been to a class somewhere else and say, you know, I really I just didn't get it over there. Can you maybe review that again for us? Uh, listen to what they're talking to you, Randy. No, Not yet, but we will. We will. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, if I could show, if can I have eight people so I can show two two other things on, on and just a, a funny thing of trying to get the teaching thing across. You gotta go get your own woman. I ain't gonna get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Pat. Arnold was shopping. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, you guys are the heads, okay? Head star through. Now, this is the first place that I like to introduce Zoom. I talk about leaders and I talk about trailers. Remember, blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 right? I do try to do some of the blah, blah. But when I want... The action to occur, my situation has been that I seem to, the, the, the centers you call Zoom and the leaders in, in the Zoom arrangement, not arrangement, but you know what I'm saying. Anyways, they don't move. The trailers never have any problem. They know they're supposed to move up. It's these lead guys that won't get out of the way. And so I told the trailers, hey, if they won't get out of your way, just reach up and pinch them. They'll move. And, and, and yeah, and I and, well, and I demonstrated like pitch them, you know, and uh, 
You know, nobody has to get pinched. It's just the threat of the pinch. <laughs> and once in a while, you'll see somebody that get, gets left in the middle, all right? And they'll kind of wander around, but then the idea will dawn on them that they're, they might get pinched, all right? So, zoom. Now, see, these people move, by golly. All right. <laughs> yes, okay. Trailers, get your pinchers available, okay? Zoom. And by golly, they'll move quick. And... Uh, um, that's just one little extra thing that I've done to teach Zoom, just to plant a little thing to, that there needs to be an immediate reaction from the leaders because then the trailers have no place to occupy if there's somebody in their way. Okay, moving on to another call because I do want to leave time for sharing and comments and stuff. Um, pass through and step to a wave. If I'm going to teach all eight circulate and I'm talking about the center track and the outside track, this came from a new caller. This is why I love doing caller schools, because they have the most brilliant little teaching things that they come up with. Now, the girls have this little inside go-kart track. You're in the go-kart, okay? And you have to stay in the little go-kart area, all right? Ends, boys, you are NASCAR. <laughs> All right, you're gonna go, you got to go whipping around a wide turn in order to get to where you're going, and you got to get up here pretty quick and occupy your spot. Yeah, down the straightaway. Thank you, Betsy. Very good comment. Okay, all eight circulate. There you go, and you'll have one person, God love them, who will make a noise. Okay. <laughs> It happens every time. They'll make a noise. And you can isolate them and get them to move. Okay, all eight circulate. Mm, somebody else might maybe chime in. Swing through. Okay, now the boys have the go-kart. And the girls are NASCAR drivers. All right, all eight circulate. And many times that's the only reminder I have to give them. It's painted a mental picture for them to hook into. They can make noise if they want to, if they want to get in and be silly. And, of course, he's thinking about, okay, now where could I go and take this person and how could I get this guy over here on a NASCAR? And then, but maybe I could interrupt the NASCAR with a... With <laughs> so, okay, whoever is thinking the plays is in the game, but they're thinking about it a little bit differently. So Arnold may not be making noise, but he's paying attention because he's planning out the next strategy. Thank you, dancers, very much, okay? All right, now, um, Jerry, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we open it up to, uh, to any questions? I have one other little thing that I would... All right, no, I, I don't think so. I, I, we need to have fun with our dancers, and again, reduce frustration, be efficient, be effective, and, and have fun. Listen to what they're telling you, have fun with them, uh, Go-kart, it works fine on a walk and dodge. I tell the girls, if you turn around on a walk and dodge, you'll be sick in the morning. Yeah, totally. yeah, they'll remember that. <laughs> At our age, that ain't fun. Yeah. Um, we're also talking a lot at this convention about increasing the sociability of, our, of what we're doing. Um, a little thing that has helped us is um, we will tell the, uh, okay, this tip, every angel, go choose a, a new class person. And they'll go and get, so we've mixed them up, okay? And they get out there in, in that. And then we also tell them, gentlemen, never walks off the floor and leaves a lady standing there. Never. You always escort your lady off the floor. And it's the cutest thing to watch. And we used to do that years ago, remember? We all did that. And uh, that, that has this helped is teaching them to, to do that, and they'll escort her over and, you know, and smile, or, or they maybe even sit together. At, uh, that group will, will sit together over the little break period or something like that. We definitely need to encourage that. That's what also helps them bond and keeps them coming back as a group because there has to be something else other than just the dancing that's going to make them a cohesive group that continue to come back time after time. One of the other things that you need to think about is to be uh, thorough with your teaching. Teaching an ocean wave from uh, facing couples in a zero box is one thing where you've got the girls on, in the center, boys on the ends. But if you have a zero box, touch a quarter and trade the centers, that ocean wave looks very different to new dancers. And to just call a swing through cold, you might expect that they would have some problems with that. Don't be afraid when you look at a different formation to reteach the call that they understand the definition will hold. It's very important and keep your frustration down. Now you had one other thing you said? 
Um, um, when we were talking about teaching being so important, how many of you are actually trained teachers? I was trained to teach elementary school. I wasn't trained to teach adults. Okay. How many of you were trained to teach square dancing? Or did you just go out and start a class? That's what we did, huh? We all kind of went out and started a class. Maybe, maybe we mentored a class or, or something of that nature. But for most of us, when we go out and teach a square dance class, we teach the way it makes the most logical sense to us as a learner. The way we were taught. Because the way we were taught is what makes the most sense to us. And if you happen to be an auditory learner, and you can actually hear something rather than blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 if you actually are able to process the information that comes to you verbally, you are going to presume that that's how everybody learns unless you're told that people have different learning styles. And I truly believe that our learning styles are pretty much inherent, kind of like our eye color. We, can't, we can expand them, but I don't think we can change truly how we learn. So what do we have to do as instructors? We have to change how we teach. So we hit all the different learning styles that are out there. There's three main ones. I know y'all have heard this before. There's the kinesthetic learner, the person who has to walk through it and do it. That's me. I can hear it, and I can only process it so far. Then I've got to walk through it. Then I've got it. You've also got the visual learner who may want to watch the square or the, the visual learner who wants to read the definition and can internalize that. I actually know people who have sat down and read the definitions to a program and gone out and danced it. That would not be me. I need to go through the actual physical walking of what we're doing. So I did want to mention that, <clears throat> that we're not usually trained in how to go out and teach all this stuff. Um, I asked Dennis, who had had such wonderful success with his class, what are some of the fun things that you do? And he thought for a second and he said, well, they're kind of spontaneous. I said, but you need to start remembering them because we want to know what they are so that we can use some of those and go out. So did you remember some of them, Dennis? Because I asked you to speak a little bit to maybe a couple of things at this meeting. I said, I've given you 20 hours to remember what it is that you've done because we're so excited about his class. Now, you do have to talk on the mic, Dennis, so people that are driving down the road right now and listening to the tape will be able to hear you. doesn't work. Let's try this instead. Oh, I'm Dennis O'Neill from Silverthorne, Colorado. Timberline Toppers. We dance at 9,100 feet. Frank's been there. Um, I can't add too much what everything they've said. I mean, we've done a lot of spontaneous stuff here. Um, I just kind of see what's going on and react to it and just have fun. One thing I would like to add to what you've already said is that there's always that at least I've had in both my classes, because I've only had two, there's a young lady who seems to be somewhat of a wallflower, very shy, very scared to death, and I make her my friend right off the bat. I harm around her and, and just tell her that it's going to be okay. You know, they need a lot of positive reinforcement, but, you know, it's kind of like what we did with Justin this morning. Yeah. <laughs> it just seemed like the right thing to do. And he took it so well. So, I mean, I, I really, like she said, she hit me yesterday, and I started thinking, what do I do? Well, I do what Don Rouse does. I do what Bear Miller does. I mean, these are the guys I've, I've enjoyed dancing to who have fun. They're having fun up there, and I'm having fun. And so if I'm having fun, then everybody better have fun. If they're not, I, I get on to them. I say, look, I'm having fun. How come you're not laughing? And then... They generally go, what? You know, and it's like, well, if you're not going to laugh, then, you know, I'm just going to pick on these people over here. And then they kind of join into the whole program. So, Or there's always the one guy that you have that you can pick on, and you know everybody else loves it, and he loves it. You know, I can pick on Bear. Like, we pick on Bear all the time, and I had a guy in my first class. His name was Chuck. Every time I tried to explain something to him, I tell him to turn around. He wouldn't turn around. So he became turn around Chuck. <laughs> this year I had three turn around Chucks. 
I'd say turn around Chuck and three guys would turn around and go, no, 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 wait, you know. So I, I don't really think there's any formula. I'm, an, I'm a retired truck driver, spent my whole life by myself in, in a truck or a piece of equipment. But I love kids, and, and I enjoy kids, and I just treat them all like kids. And, uh, but I treat them with respect as adults. They don't want to be talked down to, and uh, none of us want to be talked down to. So I just have fun and let it roll where it goes. And uh, the first year we had a group. I had five squares in this little room. And uh, I got the noticing that this square here danced really well. First tip. The next time they're over here, they dance really well. The third time they're back in this corner. And they couldn't dance worth a lick back there. That became our uh, black hole. And so we'd be dancing and somebody would be having a problem. I said, if you guys don't straighten up, I'm going to shove you over there in a black hole and forget about you. You know, and they'd have a big ball with that and laughing. And so, like I said, I think it's just all spontaneous is what she does, what Jerry does. You know, Jerry tells jokes, you know. I still want to find out, did you, did you ever get to see what her name was up in Idaho? Selma? Or... <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. Did, did she get out of jail? <laughs> He'll tell you that story. But but that's, uh, you know, I've angeled for classes, and there's no fun. There's no enjoyment. And uh, and like she says, there's times I've figured out, and you've probably all figured out because you're all better teachers and callers than I am, but I tell them pretty quick that this is a whole new language, and there are going to be times when your head's just full of mush and you can't learn anything. So dance, have fun, and play with it. So. Thank you, Dennis. Now, thank you, Dennis, very much. We appreciate that. I kind of put him under the gun yesterday. Now, I know every one of you out there has either had a thought or a call that you teach or something that has worked for you. And Randy, you had a comment, so we'd like to start with you and see what it was. Do you remember your comment? Yes, and here he comes. Randy Dougherty. Well, I, it, it was a uh, Randy Dougherty, Mesa, Arizona. Jerry teaches mainstream on Wednesday, and I get him on Thursday. And, and uh, <laughs> to show people uh, that have learning disabilities, this... This lady that had just been over there at his class came to my class, and I said, uh, eight chain five. <laughs> and she, she, would, she got her whole square to freeze. She says, oh, we can't do five. I said, why not? She says, Jerry only does four. <laughs> so I said, well, can you do four to start with? <laughs> So, and I had no idea, and later on I realized she was diabetic, or not diabetic, um, dyslexic, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, diabetic. Uh, anyway, she said, yeah, Jerry only teaches the four chain eight and the, and the four chain eight, or eight chain eight. Yeah. Eight chain eight and four chain eight. And I said, well, there's some other numbers that we can do. She says, well, that's that, uh, is it, how is that different than the four square then? She was dead serious. Her mind worked backwards, put the number, the word. So I just pointed that out to me and uh, while you were talking about the learning disabilities. So the next time I'm playing golf, I ask him, try to use the five and the six once in a while. He did. We were playing golf, and he says, what about this four chain eight? And I'm just looking at him like I'm stupid. You know, where did this come from? Randy and I have, have enjoyed a remarkable amount of, of success moving dancers back and forth between our classes. And it's been fun to work with him. If you can find somebody like that who is a, a good teacher, a quality teacher, you can have a lot of fun and you can really enhance the learning process of your class. Any other questions? I have one. Oh. Okay. Just once. Um, this is a cute story. How many of you teach Grand Square and you really work and focus on those 32 beats? By golly, we're going to do 32 beats. Okay, well, we do. And uh, we, had, we had our dancers to the point where we were actually, if you saw the dancing that was done on Sunday night, where I was hearing 
boy's face, grand square, and they're just going through like it was just awesome. And we have been doing a little bit of that with our beginners to get them on that 32-beat thing. So our beginners have been in class for a while. Now it's time for them to go out to their first beginner dance. And they went out to this beginner dance, and by golly, they can do grand square from anywhere. And the caller called sides face grand square six steps. Okay. And our dancers went through the first 16, and they reversed it, and they went through the other 16. And he called it about three or four times, and finally he said, No, no, folks, look, I only want you to do the first six steps. And one of our dancers turned around to him and said, our instructor told us it takes 32 beats and we're taking every one of them. (laughs) That is such a great story. And and John and I went, the one thing we didn't do was fractionalize it. So you think you're so being so cautious and so careful. Um, I think Betsy was first and then John. Betsy Gata from New Jersey. And I have about four things I want to want to share. One is both uh, Jerry and Deborah mentioned about teaching adults. They have an identity. They have, they're grown up. One of the things that I seem to have correlated is that the higher the position the person held in their working job, the less tolerant they are of their own mistake. So you can kind you can defuse it somewhat by talking to the person in the break and saying, "And what do you do for a living?" And they'll say, "Oh, I'm the CEO." And then you can kind of say, "And that means you're really smart." So, but that but being really smart does not always mean your feet go the right way. And you can kind of defuse the situation and you work hard for it. Another Situation diffuser when they get frustrated, and they talked about you can't let people get too frustrated. New dancers especially, they are they focus on what went wrong. They can do ten things right, one thing went wrong. They are focused on what went wrong. Now my husband is a big fan of baseball, American baseball, and I've been to the Hall of Fame more than once. Most of the people in the Hall of Fame batted. 350 or less. That's one out of three tries, right? So why are the square dancers 1,000% before they get in the quote square dance hall of fame? So I tell them now, focus on what went right. Watch the Olympic gymnasts and the skaters. If they fall in their routine, what do they do? They get up and they finish unless they're out cold. And when they finish, they go, ta-da! And I've had whole rooms of dancers flinging their arms up in the air and finishing. And it made them feel better about themselves. So it diffuses that frustration. Last thing I want to mention is is you just talked about Grand Square. I have a group at a senior center. And one day I decided to start on Grand Square. I have about two squares of people. If late 60s would be the youngest. None of them had ever danced before. And my husband happened to be there that day to help me out because his school was closed. And so I figured this was a good time to teach Grand Square. I got someone on the floor to help and whatever. And we got through the first 16 beats. Reverse went every which way. So what I figured out to do for the next two or three months was we did sides face Grand Square and did 16 beats. And then we did something else. After they were comfortable with that, I had heads face reverse grand square. And I taught reverse grand square for, and that only took a few weeks to to come together. And then we did the whole thing. It was a different way of looking at it to build it up for them. Because if you can avoid a pitfall, they will then succeed. Thank you very much, Betsy. Um, Oh, oh, all right, I'll share. John never gets frustrated. It's me who gets frustrated. We had a bad evening, okay? We just had one of those evenings that was really 
lousy. I couldn't get these people through anything. And I'm trying to keep the smile in my voice, and I'm trying not to let them, trying to praise anybody who's anywhere close to where they're supposed to be. And after the tip was over, I left the stage, and I walked into the kitchen that is at the back of the hall. There were only two people that were sitting in the kitchen, two club members, the one who has been helping run the class since Hector was a pup, and the other was the treasurer of the club. And I went over to the oven, and I pulled open the door, and I got down on my knees, and I stuck my head in. <laughs> and they looked at me, and then one of them said, Deborah, it ain't gas. So now it's become an, uh, just a little uh, under, kind of a little in-joke amongst the club members. If they see me heading for the kitchen, they're like, you know, they, they look up or they'll say, uh, no, we're going to do really good tonight so we don't send you to the kitchen. And n- none of the, of the beginners would ever, would, they never heard anything about it. I would never, you know, it was just, oh, I just thought I've got to go do something. And, and that just seemed silly and ridiculous. And, and we all had a laugh about it. And now it's kind of become an end joke. So, yeah, that's what happens when instructors get frustrated. <laughs> I'm Ed Clavon from Nebraska. Um, this is probably just a comment, but uh, Jerry and they made comments about, uh, you know, they have problems sometimes that you don't overlook, but you got to sometimes uh, kind of got to smooth them over and, and apologize, and you can do it gracefully. Probably one of my biggest uh, problems is probably uh, if I had any problem was lying about all the rest of them. So... <laughs> Anyway, what I'm calling, and uh, I enjoy dancers. <laughs> I enjoy dancers, uh, and whenever they're having fun, sometimes I get tickled. And when I get tickled, I can't call. And, I, and really, and so I feel embarrassed. That they think I'm dancing. Uh, they're actually laughing at them. I'm laughing with them, so I try to explain to them that I am laughing with you, not, you know, because you're making a mistake. So... What happened to me, I could tell you several stories. I should write a book, but uh, one particular new class, we had a tall fellow that had kind of lightish red hair. Uh, he was having some problems, so like Jerry says, you see that he's having problems, so you walk down there and you ex- you want to make friends with him. And he, I says, and how are we this evening? He says, I'll tell you one thing, if it wasn't my wife, I wouldn't be here. So I try to explain to him we have a good time. So during this couple weeks and about three classes probably he was a tall fellow and when he got tickled he never laughed he just kind of snickered and his face got real bright red so i was watching and he was coming around delmer's face was bright red so i get to looking around here comes a lady around with the whole front of her blouse unbuttoned just weaving the ring (laughs) and so i have to compose myself this cracks me up and Delmer is going. <laughs> so after the tip is over, she's finally got discovered and made a couple of buttons. She's sitting way on the back of the hall. So in order for me not to make a fool out of myself, I go down this side. I talk to everybody down this side. And I go around and I come to her. I look at her and I said, I want to apologize because I wasn't laughing at you. I said I was laughing at the crowd. She just looked up in the eye and she says, Ed, haven't you ever seen a bikini before? (laughs) That's when I lost it again. (laughs) All right, we're short on time. Frank Lane. Just just a couple of quickies. Most dancers who are goofing grand squares are doing what? They're using three steps to a side because we taught them to do one, two, three, turn. And they they never hear the word four. And so many years ago, I developed a a system for teaching my people that they would count with me. When I would say sides, face, grand, square, they wouldn't say a word. I would say one, two, three. They'd say four, one, two, three. The The whole floor is saying four. But what are they doing? They're taking the fourth step. And so you might try that for one thing. And then one other real quickie. Uh, I used to teach a lot of lessons. And at one time in Lawrence, Kansas, I had a gentleman named Bob. And, and 
Bob was Chuck Turnaround. <laughs> and dur during the lessons, I would normally say, Bob, you belong one position to your right, or Bob, turn around, or, or Bob, please step over here. I was taping the lessons and sending them to a friend out in western Kansas who could, their club couldn't afford a caller. <laughs> and they, they were using my tapes to teach. I was out there about eight or nine months later and calling a dance and the person sponsoring the dance said, would you mind coming in an hour early and working with the club that had been dancing to your tapes? I mean, the class that had been dancing to your tapes. I said, oh, I'd love to. So they had just the class, not, not the whole club. They came in and they met me and I met them and we started to do a little dancing and after we danced a tip or two, this one gentleman came up and he said, it's the darndest thing. I don't know how you do it. He says, my name's Bob. <laughs> he says, every time you say Bob, turn around, by golly, I should have turned around. <laughs> it was funny, but it taught me something. It was something in my teaching that was creating a situation that was reoccurring no matter who was learning from me. <laughs> so you might use that to critique yourselves. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I wish we had another two hours to share all kinds of fun stories like this. Have a wonderful lunch. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you very much. And, um, uh-oh, and... Uh, Okay, and anyway, enjoy your lunch, okay? And so we need to shut the tape off, and goodbye, everybody. And now Jerry will tell his story. If they'll shut this tape off or pull a plug. <laughs> pull, a, pull a plug on this tape.